I would like to welcome you to this session, Reshaping Labor Markets Through Technology. Uh, this is a virtual session that is going to be sponsored by the Jobs Knowledge Platform. So as we saw in the video, uh, technology is, cha is changing the way labor market work and also the definition of work itself. New technologies such as mobile phones and internet connections are enhancing productivity, are reducing transaction costs, are making it easier for people to know about markets. At the same time, uh, vulnerable segments of the population, such as women, youth, and disabled individuals, are being able to, to work and to access productively into the labor market due to technology. So some questions. What are the policy implications of these changes? The second question is, is technology only helping those tech individuals in Silicon Valley, or can technology also help the poor and the informal workers? And other question, uh, how can governance, how can governments enhance really the full potential of technology for employment creation? So the purpose of this question, of this session is to answer some of those questions through presenting you international best practices of ICT's initiatives uh, that aim to reduce frictional unemployment, basically labor intermediation, and also that promote entrepreneurship, access to market information, access to finance, and e-lancing. Uh, for that purpose, we have brought together uh, initiatives that are starting to impact their labor markets. Uh, they are Baba Job, Labor Market Intermediation, Sama Source, Microwork and Elancing, Routers Market Light, which is the provision of market information to rural producers, and the Kenyan experience of incubators and also mobile banking. In your tables, you have some cases where you can read more about these initiatives. So as you can see, this session is different and in my view is somehow visionary. And we want to convey two messages. One, that we can learn from each other no matter where we are. And the second message is, is that distance doesn't matter anymore. Uh, if you want to make questions later, you have to approach to the middle. There's a computer with a camera and you're gonna be able to ask the questions and people who are at this moment around the world will be able to hear you. We yeah. have two speakers virtually, plus a community of people that are going yeah, to be well, answering questions from different regions in I the world. I can't hear anybody speak. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you have to no. log in in www Facebook, and then Jobs Knowledge. Uh, there is a live discussion. You can enter right now and then ask questions. I have it on. And right now, let me introduce the chair of the session, uh, Arup Banerjee, Sorry. whom most of you know. Uh, Arup is the World Bank Director for Social Protection and Labor, no, but and I, I he can't oversees the World Bank's strategy and knowledge on labor markets, safety nets, pensions, and disability. Arup is an intellectual pillar of HD and a great mentor. And Arup, on to you. Pillar yeah. of HD no, okay. I can and hear. a great mentor. I can hear. And All right. I can hear. Pillar yeah. of HD no, okay. I can hear. I can hear. All right. All right. I can hear. Yes. Okay. I can hear. I can hear. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, okay. I can hear. I see that we've had our colleague Jernan from Bangalore. Hello, um, Jennifer. I see that we've had our colleague Jernan from Bangalore. I'm getting the. I'm getting our. Repeat the question. Hello, Jernan. Let's see if we can get this. This is right and lose the echo. Hello everyone, um, this is um, quite exciting and let's see if we can make this work. Um, it's exciting of course not just because um, of the topic which is uh, something that I know will be fascinating to hear about the sorts of in uh, innovations going on in the world of technology in the service of better employment outcomes but also because of the technology we are trying to use ourselves. Um, and so I hope that this will work um, and we will have a really, really exciting and useful conversation. So, before uh, we begin, let me try and introduce our speakers, um, our panel, both our panel here in Hyderabad, but also our virtual panel. 
So starting with uh, those who are here, um, to my immediate left is uh, uh, Sean Blacksford. Uh, Sean is the CEO of Baba Job. Now, some of you have already been exposed to uh, the Baba Job idea, but Sean um, heads Baba Job, which is a web and mobile startup, which is dedicated to bringing better job opportunities to the informal job sector, exactly the sort of things that um, Diego was talking about. Can these sorts of technologies be used not just for the top, very top of the working population, but also for um, everyone, especially the poor and the disconnected? To um, the extreme right of the table, as you see her, um, is uh, Alice Gitu. And Alice is the Senior Youth Development Officer in the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports in Kenya. And she's joining us, and she will talk a lot about the very exciting initiatives going on in Kenya, both about what's there in the private sector side, but also the role of the government, because many of you, of course, are from the government, and it will be useful to think about how the government can or can't play a role in some of these issues. And then joining us um, over Google Hangout um, are the two speakers you see in the second and third boxes uh, as you see them on the screen right now. So first, let me introduce from Bangalore. Joining us is uh, Ashok Nair. And Ashok, uh, hello and welcome to uh, the Google Hangout session. Um, uh, Ashok is the Vice President of Operations um, in Reuters uh, Market Light. Uh, which is a mobile phone-based uh, agricultural information service provider. Um, and it actually tries to get rid of some of the information asymmetries that exist in the market by providing farmers with personalized, timely, and actionable agricultural information. So again, welcome, Ashok. And last but not least, especially since you've been with us for a long time, uh, Jen, is uh, Jen Cantwell. Jennifer Cantwell is the Managing Director in East Africa for Samasos. Uh, and Samasos is a nonprofit organization that brings computer based work opportunities to people living in poverty across the world. And welcome, Jim. And very soon, in about seven minutes, uh, I understand, at um, 11.45 our time, we will be joined by the global audience. So I'll, uh, you'll hear me go through a little bit of the, the introductory spiel again um, so that we. Uh, and bring in the global audience as well who are uh, watching this and will be sending in questions uh, on the mobile phone. But in the few minutes we have, um, Diego has already explained some of the logistics. Um, we have uh, a terrific team helping us with the logistics if uh, technology um, fails us temporarily. But um, let's talk about what we're trying to do. If you remember, when we first um, started this conference, we had a presentation on the challenges around job creation across the world. And one of the stories that came out and that I em emphasized, for example, in some of my remarks was connectivity and information flows. Jobs are, except for self-employment, um, about connectivity between employers and employees. But even for the self-employed, it is about connectivity between the things that are produced and the people who actually want them. And actually making those connectivities happen is one of the biggest challenges, especially for those who are poor and marginalized, for those who are young and don't have the experience and the social networks that allow them to access this information and these uh, connections with people. So in some ways, what we want to try and explore through the session are these roles of con in connectivity. Some way, what we want to try and ah, uh, there we have some interesting interruptions. Uh, try and are we fine? All right. Uh, there's some microphone on right now. So what we want to do and explore in four very very different paradigms but each one of them fundamentally changing the ability of the, those who are disconnected to be connected to the world of ability, labor, which is really what we see. So I won't give you too much of a preview, 
but let me just talk about the different paradigms, the four different paradigms too much for we want to explore. Let me just talk about the different So it's Baba job. Really, the idea is about wage employment. Right? This is, we talked about wage employment and self-employment. This is really the world of wage employment. We're connecting those in the countries, as we know in each one of our countries, there are thousands and often millions of employers seeking the right people from the countries. There are at the same time millions of job seekers who want the right job for themselves. How do we make sure that there's a match? How do we ensure some degree of confidence that the information that the employer is providing to the potential job seeker and that the job seeker is conveying about their credentials are reliable and can make that match? And Baba Job is an exciting way to try and look at that. Samosos is a very different um, paradigm. Really looking at the world of self-employment, how can we make sure that the geographic location of where people are doesn't constrain them from the job opportunities that are there elsewhere in the world? If you look at the world as a whole, let's think about it. All of us as policymakers in countries are thinking about the jobs within the country and how to match that. But the opportunities for the world as a whole are vastly greater and the skills matches, there are many more possibilities if you can actually connect them. And so what Samosos does is try to make sure that there are ways in which people across the world, especially in the poorest countries, can connect those who have the ability, have the skills to do that. And finally, the last two paradigms are something quite different. When you talk about the RML, which is um, the Schultz Group, it is really empowering self-employed again, in this case farmers for the most part, with information. So that they are not constrained in their productivity by a lack of knowledge of where the market is and what it can do. And finally, if we go to um, Kenya, which Alice is representing, there is this explosion that all of us, I think, are very excited about of using the opportunity of, afforded by the deep penetration of mobile technology into the countries, in every one of our countries. The poorest person may certainly doesn't have access to the internet, um, certainly doesn't have access to a laptop and for the most part, but they have access to a mobile, the very simple, the most basic mobile. And that changes everything. That changes the way in which we can actually do a lot of things. And in particular, what we'll try and concentrate on and have a discussion on is how they can be linked to the financial world. How mobile banking can actually change the ability of poor people to change their lives and invest in their future. One last logistical note, and then we will try in two minutes, and I'll get the signal, I'm sure, from my colleagues, um, that we are actually online. Um, and so I want to welcome everyone uh, who is joining us from around the world into this Google Hangout space. Um, we are going to start a conversation in which I invite everyone to join. I am Arup Banerjee, I'm the director for the benefit of the audience who's joining us. I'm the Director of uh, Social Protection and Labor at the World Bank. Welcome. And we are trying to go and have a conversation where we will try and explore from participants around the world, but this very large and distinguished group here in Hyderabad, India, about the role of technology and jobs. For those of you who are entering online, please keep on sending us your questions. Um, type them in, and we will try and reflect in the Q&A part of the session as much of your questions as possible. For those of you here, again, a reminder that we have a web-enabled and camera-ready laptop right there in the middle where Ash is holding up his hand. So when you have questions, don't go to any mic, but go to that particular computer, and then you, too, will uh, be an international web star. Uh, and talk to our colleagues all over the world. <laughs>
with that, let me begin. Um, so let's dive straight into this. Um, I'm going to start with Sean. Sean, so I've given a bit of uh, the, the concept uh, about Baba Job, but you can really explain better. So tell us, how can mobile and web-based platforms enable this matching, this connectivity between people and the jobs they seek? And how does Baba Job, what's the idea of Baba Job, and what lessons do you have for all of us in that? Uh, so, my name is Sean, uh, I'm an American, uh, but I've been living in India for the last uh, eight years. And uh, I think the story of how I got into this is somewhat relevant too. Um, I worked, uh, I actually began my career working for Iron Magazine when he was Clinton's uh, internet policy czar in White House. Um, and then I went to work for Microsoft for about 10 years. Um, I moved out here in uh, 2004 and was sort of struck by, you know, the, the sort of shock of, well, opportunities are not equally distributed. You know, one of the things I say a lot is, you know, in the States, we hide our rich and poor from each other. Um, in India, it doesn't have to do that. They didn't have to do that. And so, you know, and, and this always was a little, this was bugging me. Yeah. Um, and I came across a paper, actually, by a guy named Amar Krishna. Um, And so I, I sort of became fascinated with this idea, and that's why I started Baba Job. And Baba Job is really a big experiment. And now it's an experiment that has about 600,000 people using it. Um, you know, we have 20,000 people, or, sorry, we have 20,000 people coming to our website every day. We process about 100,000 job applications every month. Um, and it's an experiment to say, can we connect informal sector job seekers to relevant and nearby employers? And honestly, when I look at this, I actually think of it as a very hard research problem in some ways. And, and I, I actually would encourage the government folks in the room to, to almost look at it in a similar way, which is to say, our goals are the same. How do we get anybody in the world to know what are the relevant opportunities for them right now in the place where they want to work, matching the skill sets that they have um, in, for employers that they want to work with and wages that they find acceptable? And so, you know, my bias on all of this, as you'll see, is much like these research pieces, the role of government should be, in some ways, to facilitate the interaction of a lot of these players, right? That rather than creating job exchanges, which honestly there are many of today, Monster being one of the biggest in the world, and we're spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars trying to solve these problems of what's a relevant job season for this employer, that I feel like our job should be how do we encourage some of these large investments uh, to essentially go downstream, you know, we are at a stage where I actually feel like this is the lowest hanging fruit, namely the digital exchange problem of the labor problem in the next 10 years. I'm actually highly confident that most people in the world in 10 years are going to know that you can flip open your phone and use it as a way to find a job, just like we all in front of the white collar know that you can do that now. And so it's really then about what's, what are we doing to facilitate this? And, and so we'll get to that a little bit. Um, but I think there's some very simple things that governments can do around standards, around giving the poor a sense of digital identity, that, that actually go a long way to allowing the poor to suddenly be in these digital systems where suddenly the rest of these large investments can take over and people are really poorly connected. Um, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks very much, Sean. What you've done, of course, is tease us uh, in the sense that you've told us that there are things you want to talk about. So we'll come back to that. Um, 
what can the government do um, if we accept that the chance proposition that it's not the role of government to try and duplicate what monster.com tries to do because of course um, monster.com can do it much better than almost any government um, what is it that the government can do and we'll come back to that but let me then turn to Jen um, Jen you're sitting here there in Kenya and you have been working on this issue of micro work and micro work um, is something that we're all interested in. It'll be useful for you to talk a bit about what that is, and especially how, as I tried to say briefly in the introduction, how it is empowering workers, skilled workers, regardless of their location, and expanding opportunities. And in particular, given the audience here, but even given where you're sitting, how are you trying to reach the poorest, the most marginalized groups? Jen, over to you. Sure, thank you. Um, so what micro work is, it's really taking larger data projects and breaking them down into smaller pieces for distribution. Um, so because of the reach of the internet now, um, we have the capability, of course, to reach populations that we couldn't um, even five years ago. Kenya is a great example of that. And so what MicroWork is doing is it's helping expand opportunities uh, by creating employment for the poor and disadvantaged. Um, to date, Sama Source has just been in business for over four years, and we've created um, and trained and also paid uh, over 3,000 workers, over $2.5 million in wages. Um, and so I think, you know, to your, to your question around, like, how is this expanding opportunities? You know, micro work um, and an example of micro work could be something like image tagging. Um, it could be something like creating a description for an online product catalog. Uh, transcription is another kind of example. Um, and, and how it's expanding opportunities is that what we've learned over the last uh, several years is that 75% of our workers, after working on Sama Source work for a year, move on. <clears throat> and they move on to different opportunities. They may go back to school because they have the funds from working in the past year to help support that. Um, additionally, they may gain more responsibility working for our partners. So they may move into more of a team lead or managerial role. Um, and then additionally, um, they can at some times just leave that particular partner and go to a different company. But the, the point is it's given them skills in a formal work environment um, that's helped build confidence, um, helped build their teamwork skills, helped build their knowledge to then move on to the next step and help build a career that otherwise may not have been possible. I think just with reach, um, of course, uh, the infrastructure is necessary for us to get our work um, to the poorest of the poor. Um, so that's one, and that's one where governments can, can help us out a bit, I think, in encouraging that de continued development, but also training. Uh, training is really important, and um, not just technology training, but also soft skills training. So we found that when speaking with our partners, um, that's a really integral part of the process in onboarding um, our beneficiary population. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's, I think, one of the things that I'll come back to, if I may, um, is actually asking you in the next round to expand a bit on the the, the way government can help. Um, maybe you can talk about where you see challenges. This has enormous potential, and it's not potential that necessarily um, is just for Kenya, right? It is for L anywhere in the world. And it is important, I think, to understand this idea of microwork uh, because it is a very different concept to the way we employ typically most of our staff. We employ our staff on long-term contracts to do all the various pieces as and when they come up and sort of to flick from one to the other that's required um, in terms of doing that blurb or um, if just think of all the people helping out here during the South-South uh, conference. Most of the World Bank staff that you came here, uh, that you see here, are trained economists or professionals whose day job is to do analysis and policy advice. But they are putting together field trips for you, and they're putting together um, uh, 
wondering about how to have the tea and coffee service. These are all things that we do as part of a long-term career. However, this idea says that there are little pieces that actually don't cost a lot for the employer to seek out all over the world. And though for the skilled person in a remote location can provide an important source, as Jennifer said, both of income, but also of experience and connectivity and networks that can enable them to move further. So again, the question is, if this is a concept that we buy, how can the government help? I want to turn next to Ashok. Um, and can you hear me? Uh, we've had some problems, Ashok, uh, with uh, audio. I can hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Can I can you hear, hear you. Me? Can you hear me? Uh, we've had some problems, Ashok, uh, with uh, Am I audible? audio. I can uh, hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Very good. I can hear you. Thank you, Ashok. So let me turn to you. Um, and really emphasize that when we're talking about self-employment, we're talking about a world that encompasses not only the people who work from their homes and work on various service or manufacturing, but the vast majority of the self-employed are self-employed in agriculture. So for that vast majority of the population who live in the rural areas, small-scale non-farm producers, farmers themselves, what does RML do for them? What sort of solutions do you offer them and how are you helping to change their lives? Um, am, I, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, what, so what, I, R, so what RML does is provide information uh, through mobile yes. phones to the farmers. Uh, so what? So what? Are, right. So and what are we have various information sets information, that are provided uh, to basically the smaller farmers. And I'm sorry, but there's so much of echoing happening, and I, I really do not know whether you can hear me. Uh, so and I'm um, sorry, but there's so much of echoing happening, and I really do not know whether you can hear me. Am I audible? Hello. Okay, thank you very much, Arup. It's an honor to be given the opportunity to showcase 
experience of Kenya, highlighting the most successful of the initiatives. Uh, Kenya is a developing country in East Africa, and it is promoting the use of ICT solutions in both the private and the public sector. You've asked me to start by discussing the mobile phone, the, the money uh, transfer services through the mobile, so I'll start with that, and then I'll then tell you about um, what the government is doing to create an enabling environment. So, Kenya has very many private initiatives, but I've isolated two of them, and if there is time, I'll also mention a third one. One of them is what we call the M-PESA initiative. PESA is the Swahili word for money. So it is mobile money initiative. And this is, M-PESA is a mobile phone based money transfer and microfinancing service for Safaricom and Vodacom, which are the largest mobile networks in Kenya and Tanzania, respectively. Tanzania is a neighboring country. The M-PESA platform allows users with a national ID card or passport to deposit, withdraw, or transfer money easily with a mobile device. And uh, with this, workers are able to send money to their relatives, to their parents, to their wives. They're able to pay rent, school fees, wages. The platform is also used for paying dues for example, for National Hospital Insurance Fund, the pension scheme. It's also used for trading. The users are charged a small fee for sending or withdrawing money using the service. M-Pesa has, uh, has spread quickly and become the most successful mobile phone-based financial service in Kenya. Though other service providers like Airtel are also coming up with the similar services, Currently, a stock of about 17 million M-Pesa accounts has been registered in Kenya. This translates to 20,000 agents or locations, which is 20 times the number of banks available in Kenya. What does this mean? This means that uh, there is employment opportunities for the youth. The agents, the ones who are providing this service, are the youth because they are the ones who are technologically serving, not the senior people. So for us, the M-Pesa and any other uh, service provider mobile money uh, initiative is a welcome gesture because it creates lots of jobs for the youth. I've talked of 20,000. That is assuming that only one youth is involved in the transactions. But uh, from my experience, I've always found two to three youth in the, in the shop. Uh, though these services were meant for unbanked Kenyans, the banked customers are also using M-Pesa as a complement to their existing financial services. Uh, what are the benefits of this? As mentioned earlier, creation of jobs, many M-Pesa agents or outlets manned by the youth. Uh, I would say that this is clean job for the youth, something that they would not refer to as a dirty. It's also fun, fashionable for them. Another benefit is saving of transaction costs in terms of time, distance, and the actual charges, the mobile phone, uh, the mobile money service provider charges a minimal amount for transactions carried out. Another benefit is that this is a service accessible in all areas wherever there is internet connectivity. And it's a service available to all regardless of whether they are educated or not, so long as they have a mobile phone. And the final one amongst many is that uh, this is a source of revenue for landlords of the agents who are using the shops to offer these services. And 
Finally, the final finally, it is used by other platforms uh, to provide other services. For example, the next initiative I'll talk about is the iHub. The iHub, which means Innovation Hub, is a co-working space and business incubator in Nairobi that was started in March 2010 by Eric Hasman, a renowned blogger and also an entrepreneur. iHub is an open space facility with a focus on young entrepreneurs, web and mobile phone programmers, designers and researchers. Young entrepreneurs can receive mentorship, internet connectivity, and the possibility of venture funding through connections with the international venture capital community. The concept of the iHub is a first of its kind in Kenya, and there are great expectations that it will spur a revolution in the technology products and services. Uh, I, I want to talk about that one, if I am allowed. Let's come back to that. Just okay. Very piece of time. okay. Maybe I'll have a second round of questions. We can also address the second part of the question, because I think uh, all of us don't about the role of government. So maybe we should have a second round of interventions. Um, by the way, we're still trying to get your show back online. Um, the online back, uh, back online, but we get a signal where um, the microphone problems have been solved. Um, so please bear with us on that. Still, so a show, apparently uh, I hear that the microphone problems may be better. So can you hear it? Can you hear us? I can hear you much better now. Can you hear me? Lovely. Absolutely. So now, Great. let me come back to you and um, have you talk a bit um, as I asked the question about how RML is trying to um, change the lives of farmers and rural workers and rural communities. So uh, let me just start with this. So RML is basically uh, an information service provider where we work uh, through ICT and we reach out to uh, millions of uh, farmers uh, across India. We are operational in 17 states and what we provide them is with different information sets. So what we had started initially was with market rates where farmers can subscribe to any two crops and any three markets per crop where they get their daily rates of that particular commodity being exchanged. Subsequently, we move to uh, weather reports and uh, news, which impacts agriculture. And uh, finally, we move to uh, providing the farmers or the subscribers uh, with um, crop advisories, uh, which has now been rechristened as uh, farm solutions. So what the farmer gets is uh, information on uh, his crop right from pre-sowing to post-harvest, the commodity prices uh, for the crops that have been selected, on a daily basis besides the weather forecasts and along with the weather forecasts what is also given are weather based crop advisories which help the farmer uh, you know take any uh, take the right steps in order to either uh, save his crop or go in for an early harvest by which he would benefit you know substantially uh, so these are the various uh, information sets that have been provided right now. Uh, it's been just uh, over five years since we've started doing this. And we see that it has had a very positive impact on farmers so far. And uh, the renewal rates have also gone up considerably uh, with the farmers coming back saying that they have been able to benefit, uh, you know, uh, to the tune of anything between 5 to 25 percent. Now, when I say benefit, it means not only profitability, but it also means reduction of losses. So these are the two various uh, you know, uh, factors that we look into, and this is what RML is providing right now. Great. Thank you very much, Ashok. Uh, so I want to underline again what uh, Ashok is talking about. We know that uh, and in fact, we had discussed in the first day of this conference that although the vision for all of us is for all workers to work in the formal sector, in jobs of high productivity, um, in regular jobs, that is not going to be the reality for much of the population for our countries for a long time. Then the 
to make life better for those who are farmers, who are in the rural sector, the solution has to be to increase their productivity and the ability for the same amount of work and effort to do better for themselves. And one key part of it is information about markets. Again, the connectivity. Do you know what the prices are? Do you know what the conditions are? How can you actually get this information with the minimal technology, again, the mobile phone um, that is available to them? RML is an effort that's trying to make a difference in those lives. Now, what I want to say um, to the second part, and I will then each uh, of our presenters in turn, is really these are initiatives really, by far sighted, thoughtful, committed private sector actors. So, is that the future? Is, do, do all our government colleagues present here, policymakers, does that have lots of a role to do? Just to sit back? and let the private sector do all these things, and will the private sector then come in and do all these innovative things? Where is the role of public policy? Because that is the core interest. Because, of course, despite these wonderful examples showing this here, this is not universal, how do we scale it up? What can the government, as the spokesperson for the people, and especially for the poor, what can the government do? in order to make this happen and make all of these initiatives available for the wide scale. Sean, I'll get back to you. Hi. I will unmute all the things I'm supposed to unmute. Uh, okay. So my thought on this is really, I, I totally agree that we need to make these markets better and more efficient. I, I think the, the Reuters example of real is interesting because they spend a lot of money collecting that data, right? And then there's another part that happens where they have to distribute that, market it, they do lots of uh, partnerships with other cell phone companies, et cetera. And so what I find interesting is clearly if every piece of data collected at the district level were simply aggregated and made available on a site, then it would allow companies like Reuters to just focus on the marketing parts. And, and the corollary I'll provide here is actually China in terms of how they've done their digital exchanges in the last few years, which I think are very successful. I would love to talk to somebody if they're in the room from China and the labor ministry there. But in particular, they've done a great job of essentially aggregating job demand from literally thousands of factories at government level exchanges, but then making that data available to many, many other companies, such that you know there's a company called Mobile Job Hunt that takes all of that data from what are the availability of all those jobs and then they've gone out and made deals with 300 separate cell phone manufacturers to make sure that every single one of those phones has a job application installed in it. And so again, I feel like the role of government here is actually to facilitate the interop of this data. They, this is a role government has played many, many times. This is a role they did in the creation of the internet and other things. That for every government job, why isn't there a standard format that says this is the XML format of that so I can push it in? If you did that, I swear to you know, within three months, the job exchanges would follow you because if they had that data, they could suck it into their own platforms. Why isn't that every school doesn't describe a job seeker in a standardized way? So that no matter what school you went to, it was super easy to essentially take that data representing, here's the certificates I have, here's the telephone number if you want to verify it, and push that into digital systems. So clearly, I think there's an example for the governments to come in, perhaps with um, you know, with uh, private sector actors, to start a first set of standards. Don't assume you're going to have the last standard the first time out. Just begin. The other one that I see that India has started doing, um, but I, I don't think they've done enough yet, is around verification of the poor. That if you want to know what are one of the things that limits how the poor can work, is they don't often have the requisite identity documents and proof that they say who they are that they can go to employers, and thus employers often then can take advantage of that and exploit it. When we talk to our informal sector employers and we ask them, what is it that you most want from job seekers? They say skills, they say references, and they say government documents. And it's odd to me that actually for me to get those government documents and showcase that in a way on my digital site is very difficult today. I have to take pictures, I have to, up, I have to encourage people to upload these things. 
If there were a way, essentially, where I could say, listen, here's the number that the job seeker gave me, and here's his mobile number, is this government ID significant, or, or sorry, is it true? And this is essentially the essence of what the UID platform is trying to do, but it hasn't quite done it yet. Um, and then the third one, I, I'd say, just to sort of push home this data point, which is in technology, one of the reasons that I would argue that people like Monster and others have done so well is because they're sucking in data from all of their job seekers and employers in a digital format that they know how to do it. If you want to get a job there, you fill out a form on their site, right? And so we did an experiment at Baba Job where, you know, we get suggestions all the time where people come in and say, hey, why don't you do this? This would help the employment problem. So what we did is we recorded conversations with uh, essentially domestic BPO workers. These are people that speak local Indian languages that work in call centers and drivers. And so we took 200 of each one of those. And what we did is we recorded the conversations we had where people described themselves in a three minute conversation. And our thesis was, hey, employers want to hear this because employers always talk about soft skills, communication skills. And so if we showcase this, this data and allow an employer to listen to it, that will increase the employability and likelihood that this person gets an interview. And what was interesting was we did this and we found you know, that the BPO workers went from a 33% chance, percent chance of getting an interview to a 50% chance, and the drivers who did this went from a 19% chance of getting an interview to a 55% chance. But what was interesting was almost none of the employers actually listened to the voice recording. What happened was, because we had that voice recording, we were able to digitize and accurately represent that job seeker. And because we were then accurately representing the job seeker, where do they live? What languages do they speak? What's their experience? Who's the previous employer that they had? That that actually increased the interest from employers. And so again, this sort of pushes this through, that the thing that we want, if we want technology to succeed here, we've got to push hard to say we're going to digitize this data, and we're going to allow lots of actors to go ahead and manipulate it, so that each actor can essentially solve the problems that it knows best, whether they be in marketing, or creating new interfaces, or, um, or you know, outreach. So that would be you know, the two big goals, so verify the poor and allow people to get it, and then encourage these standards across the industry. I think those are two great places where we really can, in the next 10 years, make it such that you know, every person in the world can, again, flip open their phone and find a better job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. These are really challenging, but really fundamental points that we've raised. And you do realize that that's not the first instinct of policymakers. The first instinct of policymakers is to do something, not to enable things. So I think that's something that is important for all of us to hear, that it is actually enabling others to do things that is also a role for us in policymaking. Jen, I want to turn to you. Um, what is it that you see that the government's role may be in the work that you do with services? Is there, or is this something that is actually a grassroots way in which you and others like you can help this work? Thanks, Anup. Um, you know, I think just kind of building on what Sean said, having private industry work along with government, I thought of a few different areas uh, where governments could help support the private industry in creating more of these jobs through technology. Um, you know, the first, again, is something I mentioned earlier, which is infrastructure. Without the infrastructure, it's very difficult for us to deliver work over the Internet. Of course, we have to have a reliable connection with some decent bandwidth, but additionally, electricity has to be um, has to be consistent. And if the electricity isn't consistent, we need, um, hopefully, an environmentally friendly kind of backup with that as well. Um, secondly, if we could see from uh, incentives from the government in helping employ the poor, so for example, if uh, private industries, local companies are given incentives um, to employ the poor and enter, um, you know, whether it's through helping subsidize training programs um, or just helping um, helping them get their businesses um, uh, done or started up um, in a more easy way, that could also be a benefit. And then additionally, just um, really helping train for these types of jobs. So um, I've heard of some government training programs in the region here in East Africa, um, ensuring that those are planned 
uh, with the end goal of placing uh, these uh, beneficiaries in a job that's going to be available um, and in this in jobs that are that are continuing to grow um, in the digital economy. So those are kind of the the four areas that I see where governments could be of real help and support. Thank you. That's easily getting powerful and. A couple of these, of course, speak to things that we've already talked about in this forum. Um, the right type of brain and the role of infrastructure as an important and critical part in developing countries. Um, the thing about the technology that we're talking about right now, that is also infrastructure. Asha, um, turning to you, Sean spoke about the enormous expenditures that URML is putting in in terms of gathering this information and then pushing it out. Um, clearly there is a, a business proposition here, right? That this is something that it is worth it for RML to do. Do you see a role for government? Or is this again a niche that is well occupied by the private sector and the government should just step back and let do it? Um, Arup, so, uh... I, I think the need of the day is right, really to look at more uh, private-public partnerships where the government has, uh, you know, an important role to play. It is not possible just for the private organizations to do it on their own. And at the same time, uh, the outreach which the government has is far more than what a private organization could eventually muster. So uh, right now what we are looking at and what the focus would be is what I see is more uh, public-private partnerships emerging and also the uh, government agencies you know uh, getting an active uh, role in trying to uh, create the right kind of regulations and the policies which would help the partnership to really you know reach out to those consumers and uh, when when we do that what we also need to ensure is that whatever is provided is at the same time very relevant very actionable and very accurate to the consumer. At the end of the day, what the consumer wants is basically how is it going to impact or how is it going to improve his livelihood? How is it going to bring in better returns? And what are the kind of returns on investment that he could be looking at? So just adding to what Sean and Jen just spoke, you know, PPPs or public private partnerships are definitely the order of the day. And that's what we uh, in India and specifically RML are looking into where we could contribute with our expertise and we could also uh, leverage on the, you know, the, um, the benefits or, or the avenues which the governments can provide us with. That's it. Great, intro. thank you. And again, we probably won't have time to explore this, but I think it would be important to think about what sort of public private partnerships are most relevant, but they need to be in the day. Alison, the in this part of this, I want to turn to you last, and then we'll open up for questions. And I've been getting, as you saw, as you can see, lots of questions from participants on the web, but I've also opened up the audience here and had about what under 15 years or so. But Alice, what are your thoughts? And because you are, in some ways, working for the government with these initiatives, what do you see as your role and how have you worked with them? You're very right that I'm um, working in the government and um, we are even working with the private sector. Um, before maybe I go to answering your question, I would like to mention that we are implementing a project that is funded by the World Bank, a youth empowerment project which I coordinate. And we are, have embraced a public-private partnership where the, an internship and training component is being implemented by the private sector and the government funds and monitors what is happening. Going to your question, um, the government of Kenya strongly advocates for investment in ICT and telecommunications for economic growth, not only now, but in the future. To this end, the government has created a Ministry of Information and Communications and a Kenya ICT board, which coordinates and regulates the ICT, whatever is happening in the IT sector. ICT sector. The government has also developed a national ICT policy which provides a framework for investment in and use of ICT. The government spearheads 
has spearheaded an initiative to link the country to the rest of the world through a submarine fiber optic cable known as the East African Marine System or the TEAMS. The government has also laid down necessary infrastructure in terms of cabling and electricity in both the urban and rural areas to facilitate reduction in the cost of internet. The government zero rates, the importation of computers, hardware, and the uh, associated accessories. The government has also initiated a concept of the digital villages. In our country, we call them the Pasha centers. Pasha means to communicate. And through these digital villages, young micro entrepreneurs are getting access to information, education, and also access to new markets. Uh, the government, through the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, which I work, is also constructing and equipping youth empowerment centers, which are one-stop shops for free integrated services for youth-related issues. And amongst the services is training and information on ICT. The government has also created a youth enterprise development fund which enables access to cheap loan for starters or those youth who want to enhance their enterprises. And the emphasis is on uh, innovative technologies. And finally, the government has itself embraced the, e the concept of the e-government whereby the ministries are using technology to communicate to communicate amongst themselves, to communicate to the public, and even to other agencies. So for example, the government conducts its financial transactions through an integrated financial management information system. We have a human resource management system, which is again integrated with the, uh, the IFMIS or the integrated financial management system. And uh, we have a a e-health system, e-monitoring system, and all this provide information to the public. So if the public wants to get data on uh, the census, they have this posted in the government's websites, and many more uh, types of information. So I agree that uh, the government has a significant role to play not only in providing an enabling environment, but also complementing the work of the private sector. Thank you. I do have one comment. I think it's very interesting that mobile payments have only really happened in two countries in the world, the Philippines and Kenya. And what I find interesting here is, you know, you're taking two of the most highly regulated industries, telecom, and banking, and putting them together. And, and I spoke to one of the guys who was the first people that worked on M-Pesa, and one of the things that he said was, yeah, we couldn't have done this. We, we basically didn't pay attention to what the regulations were, right? Because essentially they were transferring money via phone and acting like a bank. And because they weren't shut down immediately, they were able to grow to the size where suddenly this was viewed as a really valuable piece of infrastructure. This is the, how he told the story to me. But I think this is a classic case where then if you look at the success of that, every other country, India included, has then been in a regulatory morass for the last 10 years, 15 years, with zero deployments, really. Like nothing above a million in a country of a billion people. And this is, I think, a classic case where there are times where governments need to stay back, right? To say, we don't know what this industry looks like. It might be used to fund terrorism, but, but it also has these other parts that could you know, be tremendously helpful in terms of raising productivity, improving the markets, and pushing that out. And I think there is a, often a piece in government of a desire to overregulate, to view a new industry and say, we need to come in and set some rules and make sure that we are you know, basically everybody's abiding. 
And that does prevent real business models from forming. And I feel like in this case, Kenya was wise to say, yeah, there's something useful going on here. We're not going to shut it down immediately. And essentially, every other country has, and thus there's no mobile payments, except for anywhere in Kenya and the Philippines. So I feel like that's an important lesson that you guys should also take away right here, which is, you know, if we do standards, don't make every company have to use those standards, right? It's a, it's a suggestion, not an enforcement, because the business models for a lot of these things are not clear. And until those business models become clear, you're not going to get the innovation that comes out of the private sector that's really going to contribute to these, you know, productivity growths. That's it. Thank you, Sean. On that provocative note, um, and the provocative note is a very valid one, is what is the balance? There's no, there's no answer that Sean's providing, um, and I'm sure he's not saying don't regulate because he also said standardize. I don't like terrorists. <laughs> and he doesn't like but, but I think the idea is really the important balance where it is important for all of us to be humble enough to understand that we don't need a balance. Development is a complex process where we don't need the answer, and that's part of the challenge. I'm going to open up the floor, so I'm going to take all the questions that we have. We have about 10 or 12 minutes left. So what I'm going to suggest is that um, those of you who have questions, and I'm sure you have any, line up behind uh, Ash over there. Um, please, just come up and line up there. While you're doing that, I, I won't take people in terms, so if you, you all need to be at that computer. So no other mics, please. Um, and if you'll take turns asking the questions, I will then, in the end, turn back to the panel to do that. While you're doing that, I should also read out for the panel uh, some of the questions and comments that have been uh, sent by you online. Um, I'll show Jen um, as well as Sean and Alice. Um, a couple of comments have been already on, the questions have already answered. Uh, Bin Boom from Vietnam on Facebook have said that, have asked the question that Jen actually asked as well. You talked about the government helping to make more people to IT, but what specifically they can do? Um, how can the public help pressure or encourage them to do it. So a slightly different version of the answer is here, which is what's the role of the public in this? And the government is a representative of the public. Um, a question about legacy um, that Jennifer, uh, Jenny, you were the one who uh, actually raised that in the spoke. Um, from Cameroon, uh, Nirishan uh, Clifford Bai says, um, how can we, uh, with a wide increase of technology, certain areas in third world countries who hardly have electricity are unable to benefit from these opportunities? What can be done to ensure people in rural communities also benefit from such facilities? And finally, I want to share, and I don't know that we have answers, a reflection from Jessica Jitapong at the LSC in London, who writes, Technology, along with globalization, has redefined many aspects of our lives. Sometimes these changes have produced a backlash from society. What are the cultural implications of using technology to reshape the labor market, and how should we deal with it? I want to throw that question out there and see if our panels have any reactions to that. So we have four uh, people in the audience uh, here in Halifax who also will come up one by one to the cameras and talk. Bonjour, merci pour vos présentations. Donc, euh, le cerveau de Timaron. Let the translation. Je vais le cerveau de l'initiative pour pouvoir être en permanence professionnel du Maroc. J'ai deux petites questions. La première, ça concerne la digitalisation de la digitalisation immobilière. Euh, on peut aussi euh, prononcer au plan pour là. Euh, la question, c'est que, euh, euh, puisqu'on veut utiliser ces téléphones immobiles pour euh, les, les agriculteurs, etc., euh, qu'en est-il pour les, les, les gens qui ne sont, qui sont un pas analphabètes C'est-à-dire que la téléphone immobile, euh, je crois qu'il est impossible, euh, qu'il est difficile de l'utiliser pour les gens qui, qui sont un peu analphabètes. La deuxième question, c'est que euh, le droit à l'accès à l'information et le droit à l'accès à l'emploi doit être égalitaire pour tout le monde. C'est-à-dire que euh, 
on ne le voit pas, euh, et pas d'être égalitaire pour tout le monde. Et sachant que les, autres, les présentations qui ont été faites ont été faites par des entreprises privées, donc qu'en est-il pour le financement de ce, de ce service Quoi, mon sens, que le service euh, de l'emploi doit être un service public. Mais comment les, les, les entreprises privées et dans ce service sont, sont payées, sachant que le service est destiné à elle, au port Et merci pour vous. Thank you, and merci beaucoup. I'll translate for our, uh, uh, I'll translate, but I'll summarize the question for those of uh, our audience watching the web. There were two questions uh, from our colleagues in Morocco. Um, one was on mobile technologies. Um, the idea is that this is certainly offering opportunities to uh, the farmers and others uh, who can read and write. But what about those who can't read and write? How can we ensure that they get these opportunities? And how they get their capital? A second question is a, uh, is a deep one on the right to information being based on equality. Um, a colleague from the U.S. we knew that everyone should have the same access to information. And the question really was, doesn't information being privately owned and managed um, threaten this? Shouldn't the public sector own all information so that it can then share uh, with the all of the So these two questions for our panel. My name is Hania, I'm from Egypt. Go ahead. My name yep. is Hania, I'm from Egypt. Um, one thing governments can do is encourage and experiment with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I see um, in Nepal, where um, an NGO has developed a model of what's called a daily IT worker. So it's taken the idea of health workers to IT, either young women who are trained, and they go on to the village to make it. Women, particularly women in remote villages, a chance to use laptops to download information, to send their pictures to loved ones. And I think this is something that um, should be developed, uh, that is the, the idea of extension workers in the field of IT. Then I have two questions. One is to show you, is there a worry about developing a digital ghetto of the very core, where these websites are dealing with the ultra war, and wouldn't it be possible to open this up to all sorts of jobs so that there's an equalizing effect? Um, and then my second is to um, uh, the Reuters experiment. I, I think I came across this uh, experiment in the CEO of the one cooperative where there was this lady sharing, and I wonder if you should think about giving, uh, encouraging this model amongst cooperatives of uh, the one I saw in this producer, uh, where they were using IT to share information about the weather, the prices, and so on, and also to use it to address issues like inflation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nabil Abdul. I'm the director of the Fishing Services presenting to the Congress. Use of technology is good for uh, like um, uh, reaching everyone in short time. But I think uh, sometimes um, technology can create uh, problems for innocent people, um, who are especially illiterate and uh, of the poor. Um, because many clever people uh, start getting uh, benefits out of technology by, by deceiving innocent people. Um, why I'm asking this question? Because we are facing this problem in Pakistan on a very large scale. Uh, people are getting, like, a uh, lot of people are uh, getting benefits uh, by deceiving the poor people and innocent people um, who, uh, who are usually from the rural areas. Um, so, my question is how, how we can eradicate uh, broad elements associated with, with the use of technology? Because I think when somebody is indeed Mi nombre es Carlos Madero del Servicio de la de Empleo de Octubre. En primer lugar, con la salud, creo que este tema probablemente, por lo menos para mí, es uno de los más importantes de la empresa. Cuando hablamos del Servicio de Empleo, 
en Honduras, a como un día de nuestra ayuda a traer nuestro libro de empleo, que es una situación cultural, que hoy por hoy para nosotros representa un verdadero éxito. Y parte de los cuestionamientos que tenemos es cómo ampliar con las, tecnolog las, las tecnologías, y por eso sí, me dio unas preguntas ahí abajo, va a ser un ratito, ¿verdad? Y hoy ya, ya las puedes dejar. Creo yo que, que sí es importante cómo podremos entrar en esta relación público-privada, porque los servicios dan la garantía a la población, de los jóvenes, los que tienen acceso a los servicios, dan la garantía a la para que ellos puedan acceder a esta tecnología. Y creo que debería ser un pensamiento que debemos de tener en los próximos 10 años, cómo hacemos esta alianza, porque también quisiera dejar la reflexión que no es posible que el Estado llegue a toda la población, cuando el sector privado no puede ser. Y eso creo que debe ser una parte fundamental de la decisión. I know that uh, for all of this world uh, press, of the level of infrastructure in Kenya, but um, one of the problems uh, in a number of uh, uh, countries, multi countries, is that it is. I wonder what um, is there in place to actually cut this because. Uh, because people are not employed, whenever the government has put in place a lot of infrastructure, uh, there is that tendency of uh, trying to analyze the same infrastructure that is supposed to be used to enhance communication. And uh, that's one of the problems that you're facing in Malawi. Sometimes you find a cable for different life, and you have no internet for the whole week, and so on and so forth. Secondly, I also wanted to um, um, <clears throat> find out the issue of uh, connectivity that has been said. I noticed when I came here in Canada that uh, every probably four or five hours we find a spark off and on. And I presume this is not the, uh, the only country who also experienced the same. To me, it looks like it requires a lot of investment for a developing country to have stable um, power. And uh, I don't know um, the terms of um, supporting such interventions, how huge. To reach out to every corner of the country in most of the world. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here because uh, we are running out of time. And you want to listen to the answers, but you want to listen to my questions. Uh, otherwise, we will run out of time with the answers. So I apologize to those um, who are still wanting to speak, uh, but I am sure that uh, colleagues at least here have the budget to be happy to engage. I wanted to, before turning it back to the panel, and this time I'll try to go in reverse order. Uh, I'll start with the show, uh, followed by Alice, uh, followed by Jim, and uh, have, let Sean have the second and last word for me. Um, I wanted to, uh, again, for the benefit of our uh, web audience, simply summarize um, the question in Spanish for those of you who didn't get it. It was really, um, again, asking the question that is of the moment of how we can get into the Um, so one of the questions, uh, if I've understood correctly, was um, how do we get into the private-public partnerships? Is that the question? Okay. So you see, one of the biggest, um, uh, what do you say, um, uh, 
one of the biggest things that they're on the government is you know, extension services. You know, and extension services is what uh, is now being spoken about and is what is required to reach out to the, you know, the rural masses. And when we get into the partnerships with government agencies, what we are able to provide or what the private companies are able to provide is basically provide them with the information on the extension that they aren't able to reach out to the various you know, uh, masses out there in the rural uh, areas. Uh, what we have been able to do through ICT is that the connectivity, you know, though it, not, it may not be all that good in certain pockets of uh, the rural India, but you know, to a great extent, the connectivity is, is pretty good. And, and when we are able to reach out through the mobile phones, what we are able to do is leverage on the extension services which the government wants to pass on and thus we uh, provide the consumers with that extension service. Now extension service could not only be just market data but also all the other information sets that I spoke of earlier. Um, secondly, uh, I think another question was uh, what happens to those areas where there is lack of uh, electricity or where there is no electricity, how do we reach out, right? So, you know, in those areas, um, see, to be honest with you, where RML is uh, operating is uh, basically in those 13 states in India, uh, sorry, in the 17 states in India, where we know that there is at least enough electricity where, uh, you know, there is a possibility to at least recharge your phone. The network connectivity is far better. And for people who are unable to read or, uh, are, or are illiterate, uh, we also provide them with outbound dialers or that is voice calls. So voice calls and also an option of a toll-free number where they can dial in and you know, leave their questions. So uh, where there are uh, customer center uh, champs who attend to their questions and revert with the resolutions for both uh, queries for those who are not our subscribers and for complaints uh, for whom, uh, you know, for, for those people who have already subscribed to our service. So that's how we go about addressing it. I, I really could not follow if there was any other question. Um, it wasn't a bit, uh, it was rather uh, inaudible or a bit muffled. So are there any other questions, Arup? I would like to answer those. I think the only other question was um, how this, uh, that was aimed at you, was um, how do we reach out, uh, how do we not, and we ought to answer this, how do we not create a digital ghetto, and how do we also incorporate corporate and other actors in the rural areas into uh, these uh, information sharing arrangements and to what extent your initiative does that involve Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, I think it just got muted somehow. Um, so uh, what I was saying is that we have also tied up with some of the big cooperatives in India where, for example, with the dairy sector, where we know that these are the various requirements that the industry requires or the various requirements of the industry which we try to address with our team members. And at the end of the day, what we are able to provide them is a better outreach and a better extension of their services, which again goes to the consumers who are you know, part of these cooperatives. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ashok. Let me turn back to Alice then um, and see which of the questions do you want to tackle? A lot of uh, questioning about the role of government, isn't there? Um, uh, uh, I would like to respond to two questions. One on uh, the issue of those who cannot read and also tourism. Uh, with any development comes challenges. And uh, for the case of Kenya and the mobile money transfer services, we have several challenges. One of them is what you have already identified, that is ICT illiteracy amongst 
certain members of the community, and especially the senior members of the society. Um, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. The government is coming up with policies to see how we can educate and educate everybody on ICT, educate them on ICT itself and also ICT etiquette. Uh, reason being that um, other challenges are homemade. Criminals who are in jail are using numbers to call people and tell them that they have sent them money by mistake and they ask you to send it back to them. Sometimes they tell you that uh, they are crying in a hospital and telling you that uh, I have my patient who needs to be discharged but I cannot because I've just sent you by mistake this amount of money. Can you please reset it urgently? And without thinking, people are just resetting. So there's a lot of money there. We have trustworthy agents who, after they make a transaction and they show you that they have already sent your money wherever you wanted it to go, they reverse that and you run it around that the money never reached. We are also having issues of, uh, and this we have identified non-connectivity in the rural and remote areas. And uh, finally, we have a big issue that has come up recently where armed robbers are visiting the agents and getting money from them. Now, I agree that uh, the government has a big role to play and they should come up with policies to address education and also to encourage more people to invest in ICT. As for vandalism, we have not experienced any vandalism of fiber optic cables in Kenya. However, we have a lot of vandalism in the area of electricity. Uh, this one is a big challenge for the country, but we are addressing it as it comes. Thank you, Alice. I've just been warned that, uh, as expected, uh, we are running way over time. I do want to give uh, Jen and uh, Sean uh, the last two words, uh, but I'd request them to be brief. Jen. Sure. Um, I think just uh, there was a one question around cultural implica uh, implications of uh, having more jobs created through technology, and I'm happy to speak to that for just a moment um, because we've worked across several countries, but we're a U.S.-based company. Um, it's it's always important to provide context. So again, training uh, becomes very important. Um, so if our clients are from the U.S., being able to speak to that and what that means uh, to our partners and employees or, or uh, workers in the field is very important. But then on the other side, it's also um, an imperative for us to understand uh, the cultures of the workforce that we're dealing with as well. Um, and so it's just really a, a double-sided um, kind of situation where it's important that everyone uh, really develop as much context and knowledge around it um, so that we can uh, streamline the work process. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Sean. Sure. I'll speak to this issue of what, what about the poorest of the poor. I'm a very strong believer that the point of government is often to help the people that can't help themselves. And so I can imagine, I mean, this happens in my own state of Karnataka, in Bangalore, where there's government employment exchanges all over the place. And many of the poorest of the poor go to those exchanges, they get their picture taken, they put it on a piece of paper, and it stays there. Uh, that has been there for 20 years. It has placed 25,000 people in a state of 60 million. So it seems to me that that is not enough, right? You must take that further, right? And so I kind of get back to these public-private partnerships can help. I'm actually, sometimes public-private partnerships speak a little more of cronyism, right? Um, as in you just have one actor usually that wins, and then his incentive to be innovative after that is usually lacking. So I, I tend to like things that are much more open and have a you know, tax policy is a good one, right? Or that's not a public-private partnership that is encouraging many companies, including new entrants that didn't exist when you made the policy, to come in and do it. And, and standards sort of fall into that too. So I, I would encourage you guys rather than just think about solutions where one winner makes, say, the Uber job site, um, that you think about how do you encourage an entire ecosystem of many, many actors that care about servicing the needs of the poor. Um, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been, even though long, uh, a fascinating and gripping uh, set of exchanges, giving us a lot to uh, think about. Some answers, some challenges, 
and a lot to think about. I want to first thank um, all our participants, including uh, those who've joined us over the, not only uh, the Google Hangout, Jen and Ashok, uh, but also those who joined us uh, across the web. And of course, our colleagues here, um, Sean and, and Alice, who uh, have been very kind, and all of you for being patient with the challenges sometimes that technology faces. I want to end with just one sentence for us to further think about. And that is, I want to emphasize something that has not been as told as firmly, perhaps, as uh, it should be. Technology is not the solution. Technology is a set of tools. We have to think about public policy. We have to think about it, technology being one cog in this complex wheel of various ways to get the aims that we want. The hard work is not the technology. It is designing the objective. What we are trying to do is designing the processes around how to deliver those services. And then technology is a servant to these processes is the way I think we really have to think about it. But what a servant. What potential and what excitement if we do it right. And that is really what I want to leave, with, leave you with. It doesn't replace your day jobs, but it provides a very, very effective and potentially very powerful tool to make that day job much more effective. So again, thank you all for being with us and have a very, very good day. Thank you.